You're listening to The Critical Thought, where we challenge our listeners to use critical thinking when examining the teachings of Jehovah's Witnesses. Hi, I'm Daniel. I'm JT. And the purpose of this video is to talk to you about the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Judicial Committee process. JT, let's talk about Judicial Committees. What are they and how do they work? This is actually a subject that we have had so many people write us about mm. offline. And the reason why is because so many people have been impacted by what is known as the Jehovah's Witnesses judicial process. Mm. And it is oftentimes little understood by persons who are not elders, who have not served on either a regular committee or an appeal committee. Okay. Uh, as a result, it often puts a Jehovah's Witness at a great disadvantage. So let's just start with the definition. Right, so judicial says judgment, judging, jury. What is where did that word come from? What does it all mean? Yeah, the Jehovah in, in other churches, for example, like in a Catholic church, mm -hmm. they have a process that results in people being excommunicated. Okay, Jehovah's Witnesses, they have a process that is known as disfellowshipping. Mm -hmm. And in order for a person to be disfellowshipped mm -hmm. or disassociated or reproved, it typically will have to go through. A judicial process. Mm. Um, the disassociation is a separate thing today, especially the way in which they're really working it. Mm. Uh, it protects them from having to be accused of taking what we've called passive or active action. Mm. We did a video a while back on the difference between a disfellowshipping and a disassociation, and we went into that. But the process of the judicial process is something that elders are often involved in. And is this a, what's the scriptural basis for this? Well, or, or is this just something that evolved over time? Yeah. Um, the Watchtower uses the, the scriptural basis of a situation that took place uh, in the congregation in Corinth, where there was an individual who was actually involved uh, in a relationship uh, with his mother. Mm -hmm. and I Paul remember said, that. Yeah, and Paul said, remove the man from among us, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and I often tell people when I discuss this issue is that what makes it so unique with Jehovah's Witnesses is, is how they do it mm. and the things that would constitute being brought up on charges. The list often changes. So today you can be this fellowship for doing A, but six months from the day, this is no longer a disfellowshipping issue. So here you have a judicial case that will be held against you on Monday, but just three days later, the Watchtower magazine comes out with an article saying, oh, we can't dispel you. This is, we don't change this no longer. So it's really the process. In fact, this is one of the things that Ray Franz mentioned in his book is that mm. the process. Mm. And unfortunately, uh, and there are people who are watching this video right now mm. who will tell you, and we're going to invite them to share their stories, mm. who will tell you how humiliating this entire process can be, especially if you're a woman. So can you give us a specific example of maybe a judicial case that you were a part of? Uh, if I understand it, it's you've got to be an elder. So how are elders chosen, number one? And then number two, give us a specific case. Yeah. Um, I can give it my, my own personal example. Um, I was just a newly appointed elder. Okay. I was 27 years old. I was a el new elder. And uh, we just went through, they had just had uh, elder school. So, you know, you come back from elder school, you got your, your elder, your flock book, you're ready. Okay. Um, I remember coming to the Kingdom Hall, and at this time, the coordinator was referred to as the presiding overseer. Mm -hmm. uh, he tapped all the elders on the shoulder. He says, I need to see y'all guys after the meeting. We got a meeting. Got to go over some stuff. Okay. So at the end of the meeting, I told, so I told the lady, I said, you might want to go on home route with Sister Johnson, because this might be a long meeting tonight. Mm -hmm. um, and so we got in the back, and he says to us, he says, brother, I want you to let, let you know that Sister Johnson, mm -hmm. uh, she's contacted me and let me know that... Uh, she was sexually involved with a man on the job. Mm. So what we need to do is we need to form a judicial committee uh, to handle this. Okay. And at that point, he starts soliciting who's available schedule-wise and so forth. He said, well, I'm going to be in town, so I'm not going to be able to serve. Mm. And I, I remember uh, one of the elders uh, turned to me and says, uh, Brother JT, it'd be a good experience for him. Mm. And uh, so I was asked, would I like to serve on this committee? Mm -hmm. and so I said, sure, I'll be more than glad to serve. Mm. So myself, along with two other elders, we were selected. Okay. So you, you, at this point, uh, the three elders will get together and you will select a chairman. I see. Okay. And uh, the, one of the elders, he was selected as the chairman. 
And he says, I'll contact her and we'll schedule it this Saturday. We'll get together. Okay. Yeah, and I remember this so vividly because it was act it actually fell on a Christmas Day. That Saturday was a Christmas day. What? Yeah, it was on Christmas Day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so uh after field service, uh, Christmas morning, waking up everybody in their houses and who's trying to celebrate Christmas, the the three of us we got together and to meet with his sister. Mm -hmm. Um being as I mentioned, I was a young elder, mm -hmm. and this particular sister was about the same age. Mm -hmm. It was the same age as me and Lady C. Okay. And I, 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 rem I remember when she walked into the back room, mm -hmm. because at, at this point, typically, uh, in, in, in practically, no case do you really know who the elders are, and you don't get to select your own elders ah, who are going to be on your case. I see. So you, when you walk into the back of the Kingdom Hall, typically the second school or third school or the office, yeah, we didn't have an office, so we used our second school. Mm -hmm. um, she walked in the back, and she looked at me, and you could just see um, j she wasn't expecting me. Because most of the elders, you know, they're 40, 50, 60 years, so they're older. Mm -hmm. They're more like a, a father figure. And so here she's looking at me, we're the same age, you know. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. um, so at that point, um, the program, the brother gives, lays out, you know, what's going to be going, what, what, what it is, and he offers prayer. Okay. Um, what's interesting is, is that the person is not allowed to take notes. Oh. And the person, uh, when we were doing it, is not allowed to record it. And that's why if you turn on, the, uh, if you turn on a lot of the YouTube channels, yeah. you will see people have actually record, secretly recorded their elders meeting with their judicial case because you're not allowed to, to, to keep any records. Now, what's interesting, and this is really what makes us interesting, is that the person sitting across the table, and that's typically the way it's set up. You have the person sitting over there, and you have the, the three elders on this side. So it's, it's like an inquisition. Oh, absolutely, 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 absolutely. And this is why I tell people all the time, and, and this is so important to understand, your, your fate, your life, what will happen to you, it depends on these three men. And why that's so interesting is because depending on who these three guys are will literally determine the outcome of your case. Mm. And the reason why, and this is, I remember having this conversation with uh, uh, one of my mentors when I was at Bethel. He worked in the service department. And, and he was very cavalier. He was very cavalier about it. You know, society, you know, we got elders that really shouldn't be elders. Mm -hmm. But they're good men and get the friends out in field service. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so these three guys sitting in the back, they will determine what will happen to you. Mm -hmm. Some of them may be polished in terms of knowing what the society's policies are, mm -hmm. procedures, guidelines, directed SOPs. And, and then there's some guys who have no idea. Mm. They're just playing off the seat of their pants. Mm. Or they're, they're, many times we've seen, I've seen situations where they will invoke old positions that mm. the society has. And, and you're sitting back there in the, in the judicial meeting, and you get to tell the brother, oh, we, we, don't, we, we don't do that no more. Mm. Okay, oh, I'm sorry about this society meeting. Mm. We, we we're going to get you, though. Mm. And, so, you know, <laughs> and so that's the kind of crazy <laughs> stuff that you run into. Uh, <laughs> so the person, and, and I've seen people, man, that, I've seen people back there, man, where they are literally... Shaking, I mean, they're, they're 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 just because they know that in a few hours they will it will be determined whether they will be able to speak to any more of their family, mm -hmm. um, and so this is what makes it so serious because you are going to literally impact someone's life for years, perhaps. All right, let me double click on a couple of things. Okay, you said. first of all, you said no taking notes. No. So what's the logic behind that? This is my life. Um, I want to make a couple of notes so I can keep my. Thoughts organized and, 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 and follow the flow of the meeting, not trying to prove anything for anyone. What, why, why couldn't I take notes? You know, Daniel, the question that you ask is an excellent question. Why the person can't take notes? Because that will be the purpose of you taking notes so that you can keep your thoughts together. Yeah. Now, let me give you the flip side of that. While you can't take notes, mm. you can't take notes. All three of the elders over there just writing notes down. Mm. Just write. And so what happens is, unfortunately, because people are already nervous, they may say something uh, inadvertently. Mm -hmm. Brother writes it down. Mm -hmm. And so basically what you end up with is you end up with the three elders asking you questions. Uh, for example, you would ask the person a question. I'm listening to see what they say, write my notes down. And many times I will form my question based on her response. So you three can take notes. Yes. Me, the one, can't take you notes. cannot take notes. And in this specific example of the young lady... Uh, so we got three men mm -hmm. asking questions of one young lady yeah. asking about her sexual life. Sexual life, okay. Yeah. Now, I'll pause for a minute. My mother used to have a saying, that might be the truth, but it sounds like a lie. Yeah. It might be the truth that this is scriptural, but this sounds like a lie. 
in terms of its application. Ugh. Let's go well, on back. Well, what they do is they, they take the Bible and they expand into every area. And this is why I said it, we get a lot of letters about this, especially from female Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm. And the reason why is because these women are literally taken aback. I mean, literally taken aback with the type of questions that they will be asked, the details of the questions and the answers that they must give back in order to satisfy this judicial committee. Nah, nah, bruh. Hold up. Wait a minute. <laughs> Let's put some reality yeah. in it. Yeah. Off camera, you talked about this specific example. Yeah. So go ahead and give our peeps the details, the kind of questions that were being asked so that they have a level of clarity. Okay. Um, in this particular case that I was on, um, and this is part of the process, uh, I wrote about this when we first, when, when Lady C and I first left the organization, I got online and I wrote about this. Mm. Uh, some people may remember this if they go back and look at some of the posts I've done over the years. Uh, I, I, I named it very interestingly. The name of the topic that I set up it was called panties or thongs. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because of the type of questions that were being asked. Uh, in this particular case, it was my first judicial committee, so I'm, I'm not, I'm basically following the lead of these senior elders. Got these it. guys have been elders for 20 years, and they done done 10, 15 judicial cases. Sure. And, and, they, you know, and so I'm following their lead. Now, basically, I'm being schooled. Sure. I'm being taught. This is, this is, in other words, JT, watch us. We're going to show you how to do it. Okay. Okay. That's basically what you're looking at, especially if you are a new elder. So the questions are just starting to get very heavy because I don't, I don't really ask. And so the questions are getting very detailed. Mm. Now, let me just give an example. Mm. The elder asked the question. He said, what type of underclothes, underwear were you wearing? And it kind of threw me back. I'm like, okay, all right, man, where are we going with this? And uh, this has been after a series of questions. And the series of questions were the sister had to recount. And, and, and sisters who've been in this judicial case, they know what I'm talking about. And it's funny because they can't tell nobody when they leave. Mm. If they get this fellowship, they can't tell nobody. You won't believe them questions the brothers were asked. They can't do that because mm. nobody want to listen. Mm. So... They have been, we have been going different questions. And so one of the things that the person is required to do is to go back and give the details mm. of what happened. Mm. And you would think, you would think that all these grown married men back there know the basic plumbing and the basic procedure for intimacy. Well, she has to explain this to them. Detail by detail. Detail by detail Point by point. This sounds like three dirty old, old men. men. Three dirty old men, yeah. That's what it sounds like, yeah. Questioning. Yeah. In inquisition yeah. of a woman. Yeah, so you have a, you, so you have a 27, 28-year-old uh, sister sitting back here, three married men, and they're asking her about the practices that were engaged in that evening. And you're taking notes. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, she yeah, 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 yeah. She's not taking notes. You're on one side of the table. Yes. She's on another. She's on the other side of the table. This sounds like, looks like, smells like abuse. You know what? When you look, it's, you know, it's, it's only when you leave the organization and look back on the things that we've done. And, it's, and this covers everything in the organization. I mean, there's so many things I look back on. And I'm like, I can't believe we did that. Mm. But at the time, you think, you know, I'm defending Jehovah. Mm. This is the truth. Mm. We're going we're to we're we're bring Satan down. You know? and, and so you're sitting there thinking, we're going to snatch this sister from the grips of Satan. By doing this. And so your heart condition is such that you think you're actually speaking on Jehovah's behalf. Oh, absolutely, man. Every elder sitting in a judicial, think, judicial meeting is thinking he's doing this. This is Jehovah. Jehovah wants to know this. You, know? you, you said something <laughs> earlier, though, that that's the sad part, that that's they sad. actually think they're doing it for God. Can yeah. you explain? You and I, we had this long discussion about the people in the organization. And you, you hear this a lot. Do you think they know what they're doing? You think they really know what they're doing? Or you think, you know, they're, they're just faking it? And, and my position has always been it is more scarier for a person 
who actually believes the lie he's telling. Mm. See, if someone tells you a lie and they know they're lying to you, that's one thing. But you actually have people in this organization who they actually believe this stuff. Mm. They believe a lot of their telling is the truth. Mm. So um, typically, your, typically your elders, generally speaking, the ones I've served over the years, you get and you get various kinds. So they have been asking all these questions. You know, who was on top? Who was on the bottom? Was there this type of penetration? These are the and this is why we wanted to do this video because people need to understand that if you work with a Jehovah's Witness elder mm. on your job, mm. Brother Jones, Mr. Johnson down the hall, wonderful man, you need to understand that Mr. Johnson at his church, he will get sisters in the back of his church, and these are the kind of questions that he will be asking her. Mm. And the detail that these women are asked to go through is literally unreal. So after all this series of questions, the elder threw this out to this sister. Mm -hmm. Sister, what were you wearing? What kind of underclothes were you wearing? Were you wearing panties or thongs? What? And so I'm sitting like, okay, all right, well, where, where are we going with this now? And the sister, by this time, she just broke down. And she just broke down. Mm -hmm. And when the elder said, do you need to excuse yourself to go to the restroom to get yourself together? And so that's what she did. She got up. She was just crying. As soon as the door closed, mm -hmm. The, the, the chairman, he, he looked over, he said to me, JT, you probably wondering why I asked her that question. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, yeah, I would like to know why did you ask her what kind of underclothes she wearing? He says, here's the reason why. See, we're looking for motive, mm. heart condition, mm. premeditation. Mm. And I'm thinking, okay. He says, see, if she just wore regular bloomers, regular panties, mm then she could say when she got over there to this man's house, mm. the circumstances got out of control and she gave in. But if while she was getting dressed, mm. she was putting on these type of underclothes, that's intent. Mm. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness. Mm. <laughs> and so when she came back into the room, when she came back, when that girl came back, that woman came back in that room, mm -hmm. she refused to answer any more questions. Mm. She, the, the Good question, for her. The question, yeah, yeah. The questions had just gone so far and she wasn't going to subject herself to that. And as a result, she reached down, she grabbed her purse, and she walked out. Mm. My first introduction to the judicial process. This is where it was at. Your Bible-based judicial <laughs> Yes, yes, progress, yes, yeah. Um, and that's, and, and it, it's, it's, it's really amazing, man. And, 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 and you're going to see, when we, when we release this video, you're going to look down in the posting, and you're going to see, because we're going we're gonna to extend the invitation to especially female Jehovah's Witness women who have gone through this process, and they're going to tell you those questions are off the chain. You would not tell anyone that your church was asking those kind of questions. Mm -hmm. um, we want to extend an invitation, mm. especially to females mm. who have gone through this judicial process. We want you to put your comments below. And here's the reason why. We want to document mm. the type of issues. And you don't have to be those super graphic thing, but we want you to document that yes, I was subjected mm. to that same thing. Now here's the kicker, Daniel. This mm. is the, this is, I mean. And uh, when I think, when I look back now, I, I wonder where is she at? Because I, I would love to be able to find her and apologize. You know, I, I sat back there and just let those guys just roll, roll with, roll with the flow. Um, but I don't know where she's at now. Um, By the way, I want to say this, jump in. I appreciate you saying that. And maybe the viewers do too. Yeah. You acknowledging that there's an apology owed by you, oh, the yeah. other two, but the organization itself. And I'm sure that this is true for many folks that have been through this committee process. Oh my goodness. There's a... An accountability and honesty, JT, I'll say to you as your mm -hmm. guy, uh, that I appreciate you saying that. Yeah. Right? It, you look back and you realize that how you impacted people's lives. And see, and, and, and so much of this is done under the guise of this is organizational procedure, mm -hmm. policy, guidelines, SOPs. Mm -hmm. you know, the flock book says it's on mm -hmm. page 7, paragraph 3-2-1. Mm -hmm. That kind of crazy stuff. Crazy. It reminds you of the inquisitions. Mm -hmm. Very similar to when, you know, they was dunking women for being witches and stuff. I mean, that's, it, 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 it goes down that path. Um, this particular sister, and this is a very, and it's very important to understand this. When they are asked these types of questions, and, they, and, and we're going to see the comments down below. Mm -hmm. When they're asked these type of intimate and personal type questions, and they do not answer them. Cool. You can rest assured 
that when it comes to the deliberation process that will take place at the end of this meeting, this will be used against them. Mm. We well, you know, I asked her that question, you know, and I noticed she didn't respond back. Mm. And so that's it's going to be held against you. Mm. And just to, just to make the point of just how bad this is, and this is just how bad this is. Uh, when I went to elder school, I remember the, it was 900 elders right there in Alexandria, Virginia. We were right there on Seminary Road. It used to be the Radisson, I think it was called. Um, 900 elders. That's the elder school. All around the D.C. area. And I remember the Bethel instructor. And he said, now, brothers, uh, you know, when we're doing these cases, you, know, you ain't got to get too detailed. We're we all married men. We know how it works. And so this is because they're getting so many reports from people like, I was humiliated in this elders meeting. Mm. But because the person has no power on the other side of the table, mm. and they don't told you that this is what Jehovah wants, and, and every witness knows you do what elders instruct you to do, everybody knows that. Mm. Tell me more about the process. Yeah. So at this point, uh, unfortunately, because of refusal to answer a certain question, even these type of questions, that will oftentimes be held against you. Mm. It, it's, it's unfortunate, but it will. You know, she was unresponsive. Mm. She wasn't working with the program. That kind of that kind of stuff. Mm. So typically, what will happen is, and then in our case, um, we met, and the decision was for her to be this fellowship. Okay. Okay. So at that point, the chairman will take everybody's notes up. Everybody's notes taken up, and they're typically put into an envelope. Uh, the three brothers. This was this was doing during this time. Now now around the world, because of PII, processes have been changed about these types of records. What's PII? PII is referred to as personal identifiable information. Okay. And so all around the world, people are concerned about their privacy. Mm. So as a result, how you keep and maintain records about people has become a major issue all around the world. Mm. So the society has revised and how this process is done. Mm. Uh, when I was an elder, though, what would typically happen is you would actually take all the notes, okay. put the notes in the envelope, mm. the three brothers' names would be on the outside, and the decision, this fellowship approved, or you know, whatever, they disassociate. And this would go into the congregation's file. And so as a result, the three elders, if the person was going to be reinstated, those same three elders typically would be the ones who would now serve on her reinstatement committee. But this just reeks yeah. of abuse oh, of man. power. Yeah. Uh, you've got three on one, and I'm going to use that language <laughs> intentionally. You've got three on one, yeah. three men, one lady. Yeah. Uh, you can take notes. She can't take she notes. Can. Yeah. You say this is scriptural. I say this is crazy, and I'm sure <laughs> she would have said too, which is why she said she's not going to answer any more questions. Yeah. Um, wow. And so what has happened is they have taken this whole process very much like the Pharisees, and they have just expanded basic things, and they just add layers and layers on of what they do. The modern day Pharisees, yeah, yeah, that's all. The this. Jehovah's Witnesses, yeah, that's all. This um, one of the things uh, I think offline you mentioned about uh, how our elders' children handle. Yeah. Well, they're supposed to be handled equally and fairly as if it was a regular member of the congregation. Sure. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't always happen. <laughs> uh, you will find in some congregations what will happen is, and it's sad, it's very, very sad. One of the first questions that the elders want to know in this judicial meeting, mm. this is probably the most important question they will probably ask. Mm. Who know about this? Mm. Because depending on who knows about it will often determine the outcome of it. Tell me more. Well, if the only people who know about this are the people in this room, then there's no need many times or felt as felt by many elders to make it a public thing. So it will become a private reproof. I see. It's just the people in the room. And this is often what happens too many times with elders' kids. Because if an elder, if it was announced from the platform that their child has been under some type of ju ju uh, judicial action, they many times will have to step aside as an elder or they can be forced by other elders to step aside. Mm. And so what you end up with in some congregations, you get a, you get, you get a two for one sometimes. Mm. If the elders are all friends and my child got in trouble a few years back, now your child's in trouble and, and you work the program with me, sometimes elders will work the program. Mm. You now when your child got in trouble, you know, we, 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 we try to work and help them out. And so you end up with that type of scenario. And that's why many witnesses, when they look at it, like, well, the elders' kids, they'll never get this fellowship. Well, it's because many times the elders will work together. Not always, but that does happen. Favoritism. Favoritism. Cheating. Cheating. 
The flip side is, if you have elders on a body who don't like each other, mm. and your child gets in trouble now, mm. oh, you got to step aside. You got to step aside. You got to go. You it's, <laughs> they're gonna they're gonna call into question his capability to serve as the oh, elder. Oh, I see. <laughs> if the person, me, being called in, and you yeah. on the committee don't like me, that's right. You coming for me? Yeah. So we're not gonna show no leanings on your child. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna, we gonna go. And so you, you and you see both. Mm. Their elders bodies where the elders don't really care for each other. Let one of their kids get in trouble. Mm. Oh, they that will be used to remove you as an elder. Mm. Flip it over, you have elders who are friends. Oh, yeah, we're gonna try to work with Brother Jones. He's been an elder for what, 17 years? Mm. We, we, we can work with his brother. And so you and so you get that. And, the, and, and all this is what goes on in the back room. See, the average the congregation know nothing about this. The back room. The back room. The friends know nothing about this. And this is why when you know all the years I've been online. I'll have people who will come online and say so and so and so. And I would just ask them a simple question. I says, have you ever served on a judicial committee? You know, chairman or appeal committee? And the minute that they say no, unfortunately, what that means is they know little to nothing about judicial procedures and policies. So I think the question for the viewers... Mm -hmm. The supreme question you've got to ask yourself, does this sound like Jehovah God or man? Yeah. And based on what I've heard, clearly it's man. I don't yeah. think Jehovah would be asking these questions. I don't think Jehovah has a back room, does he? Um, and so this just sounds cray-cray to me. And I'm not certain yeah. why red lights don't go off in every Jehovah's Witness's mind and they're exiting the door. Well, good point. The reason red lights don't go off is because there is no red light to see. Mm. You see, when a person is studying the Bible with Jehovah's Witnesses, the process of judicial action is not something that is discussed uh, on the Bible study. Uh, in fact, there are people in general who they have little to no knowledge of how the process even works because it is not discussed. Mm. It is not discussed. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses have very little knowledge of the judicial process. Mm -hmm. For some, they have none. Mm. Because this is something that is a something that is just for the elders. The flock book, for example, is available online. People have burned up PDF, PDFs and made copies of society so upset. But for the average Jehovah's Witness, they've never have ever considered the information that elders are working with when it comes to judicial issues. Is the judicial committee judicial issues covered in a Bible study when you're thinking about and rolling? No, this is the other reason why there is no red flag, no red light, because a person who studies with Jehovah's Witness, this is not covered. There's no chapter that's going to cover this judicial process before you become one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm -hmm. That is an absolute fact. There is no chapter that discusses the judicial process. Mm -hmm. If you get in trouble, this is what will happen, that that's not done. Mm -hmm. So people, they're not working with full information. Now, you know, there's one thing better than truth. The whole truth. <laughs> and what I'm hearing is the whole truth isn't presented to oh, the no. Bible study oh, or no. the Bible student. Oh, no. But yet you called yourself the truth. Yeah. How dare you? Yeah. Uh, this is stuff you'll learn later on, as they often say. Mm. Yeah, of course, by then it's too late. Yeah, well. Um, but yeah, this whole process, man, is, is just it's really uh, very fascinating how it humiliates people. Mm. Uh, and as I mentioned before, there are things that can be on the judicial docket as a sin against God today. And in a few months, it's no longer a sin against God. And so this is what makes this so dangerous. Because when you're moving back and forth with what is supposed to be teachings of God, that's very serious. It's very serious. Mm. JT, there was a conversation that you and your wife, Lady C, were having about... Something about uh, once a judicial case is kind of adjourned, a person can talk to the person oh, within yeah. seven days. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, the society <laughs> is this. This is an amazing mindset among Jehovah's Witnesses. I mean, absolutely an amazing mindset. A person is brought into a judicial committee. He is disfellowshipped. Okay, he's disfellowshipped. He's disfellowshipped because he's a sinner. He's sinning against God. He has seven days to appeal his case. So if he feels that the elders are wrong, the society has in place a policy where you can appeal your case. And as a result, it will go to a second committee. Mm -hmm. So typically, during the time when I was an elder, the circuit of the seal would select another congregation or another group of elders in the circuit to be on the committee. 
And uh, I had a chance to be on one of those. You, know, you get tapped, and basically you you will rehear the case again. It's just like a appeal court. Like it's just like a regular court. You know, just you, know, you go from the from the local court to the appellate. You know, trying you know trying to get your way to the Supreme Court, I guess. And so, and so you have a second hearing. Now it's interesting that many times in the second hearing, that sister goes through the same barrage of questions. Mm. And generally speaking, in my experience. Generally speaking, appeal committees do not overturn the previous committee. It sounds like the U.S. justice system. Well, it, they, they, they don't overturn it for a number of reasons. I know all the guys who, who had the first case. And so you may be handling one of our appeal cases one day. And so you get this type of dynamic. You, you get that type of dynamic. And so while on paper it looks like, well, that's great. You have an appeal committee, yeah, but they're his friends. You know, so it's like, duh, as they say. You can't see the forest for the trees. Mm. So when you're in the midst of it and you believe that this is what God wants and God requires, you can't see it. it. It simply does not raise it. And this is why, this is why we refer to what we refer to as a high control group. So tell us some more about the seven days okay. and do's and don'ts. <laughs> I'm sure the folks want to hear this detail. Yeah. This is the most interesting part of the, the, the judicial process, I think is that after the person is told you've been disfellowshipped okay. and, it will, and you have seven days before an announcement is made to the congregation, mm -hmm. okay? So during the seven days, if the person wants to, they can appeal it. Mm. And that's what we discuss, and we'll discuss the appeal process. During the seven days, typically this person who's still technically a Jehovah's Witness, he's technically, that's, this, this is so important, he's technically a Jehovah's Witness, he will call up his family and friends. I'll let y'all know they're going to read me off in seven days. Read me off? I'll read you off. They're read gonna... me off? Mm -hmm. That's the language. That's the language. Hit me they... off. Read me off. Read me off. Read me off or what? Well, they will have a special announcement that will be made. Okay. It will be included with the regular announcements okay. that uh, Larry Johnson is no longer Jehovah's Witness. And over the years, what they have read has, has changed based on how many lawsuits they got. They used to just almost go into all detail, and a lot of people sued for... A public uh, uh, shame, shame. Or put yeah. my stuff out there. Yeah, exactly. And so a lot of people sue the society. You, know, you can't you can't publicly humiliate somebody. You, you, know, you get sued for slander. So the society legal department like we got to change the wording. We can't we can't word it like that. And so now it's a very simple announcement. Bill Johnson no longer Joe Williams. All right. So the, the, that's the definition of read off. Read off. You get All read right, off. So then what happens with these days? Now what happens is, and we've heard this, and we I know people actually done this. In fact, their family or their friends. They will go out and do all kinds of things. We're gonna go out to dinner. We're gonna do. We're gonna do all this stuff before the seven days run out. And then on the seventh day, I don't know you no more. Get out of my face. Now, if the person told you they this fellowship, that means they don't sin against God, lost God's favor, all that kind of stuff. But until it's technically time up, I'm gonna hang out with you. And I know people who have done that. Lady C, she had a couple people that she's known over the years. They would call and say, "You won't believe. They took me out to dinner tonight." This is our, it was like, as, 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 as the lady told lady, see, this is, this is the Lord's last supper. So this so, is the party before the funeral. That's exactly Okay, right. we're going to go party for seven days. That's right. Because seven days, I'm about to get red off. Yeah, I'm going to get red off, and I'll be dead. And so this is the kind of, now, this is the funny part, Dan, and everybody knows this. When you tell non-Jehovah's Witnesses this kind of stuff, they're like, you don't got to be crazy, man. <laughs> so it, it, it's, it's very unfortunate. And, and so this is the type of, things and issues that a good Jehovah's Witness is subjected to. Sincere people, man. I've heard you use the term lunacy. On it's crazy, Shabbat. man. This, 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 this is, is tune, straight crazy. Looney, Looney Tunes, man. Looney Tunes. Looney Tunes. So judicial committees, elders, females, some can take notes, the others can't take yeah. notes. Faith versus folly, yeah. Jehovah God versus man-made. Yeah. So what else do you want our viewers to know about this whole process? What, what often happens is, especially with, with elders, elders are kind of in a unique position. An elder can actually talk to a disfellowship person. Okay. And as a result, nobody would even look at it suspect. Okay. Okay. So if, if, if a witness sees an elder talking to a disfellowship person, they would just assume, you know, this is congregation business and so forth. Well... We know, Lady C and I, we, we know elders, especially Bethelites. These, these, these are some ex-Bethelites I know. And uh, current Bethelites too. Uh, what they, they had a friend mm. who got this fellowship. Mm. And so they would use the fact that they were uh, elders 
to still talk to, talk to talk to these guys. And so, you know, it, it had nothing to do with, you know, are you coming back? They just they were just they basically carried on the same relationship. Hey man, you're doing pretty good, man. How things out there? Pretty good, not too bad. Because they could. They were using the way it worked. And then, of course, you know, during the judicial process, many times the elders have to reach out and find, try to contact the person. Okay. So typically you would call the person up, leave messages if they don't respond. Uh, sometimes elders will actually stop by the person's home. Mm. Uh, I know elders where they have gone to people's home. They, they, they have a general idea what time you get off work. Uh, we had a situation where elders on the committee, they went by the person's house and uh, put their hand on the hood. Mm. They just got home. And so they knocked on the front door, around the back, knocked on the back door, and nobody came out. They're like, he inside, he inside. <laughs> and so what they did, they then sent the person a certified letter. Mm. But at the end of the day, the judicial meeting will be held. And this particular meeting we held, <laughs> uh, it lasted probably less than five minutes because mm. we, we, we just went on. So this person was, was read off in seven days. So, I mean, this whole process is just a fascinating process. And I guess the, the main point is, Jehovah's Witnesses know nothing about this. Mm -hmm. They don't know any of the details about how this thing works, how they don't have literally any rights when they step in that, in that, in that back hall. The purpose of this video is to educate you and your family and your loved ones. If you like this video, love this video, share it with a friend, drop comments, as JT said earlier, especially to the ladies mm -hmm. that have knowledge here. Yeah. If you have experienced this, share it with us. Let, let's document this so that people can see how this process impacts and probes into the most inner and personal parts of people's lives. This is JT. Dan the man, J to the T. We'll see you on the next video. Hey, this is Lady C. Thank you for tuning in to The Critical Thought. We appreciate having you in our audience. Not only that, but we invite you to subscribe to our channel and be sure to hit that bell so that you can receive notifications when we upload new content. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter and give us a thumbs up if you like this video. Thank you for being in our audience. This program was sponsored by Critical Thinkers.